Good afternoon, folks. Larry Miles here in Louisville, Kentucky. I want to do a Facebook video in my series on restoration history. This is on the history of a magazine that's been around for a long time, in print for a long time, and now online, Word and Work. Word and Work magazine started in 1908 in New Orleans and moved to Louisville in 1916, was in print till 2008, 101 years in print, had been online since then at wordandwork.org. I'm going to read or talk about something using some text that our last editor of our print magazine, Brother Alex Wilson, who was a longtime missionary to the Philippines and preacher at the Portland Avenue Church of Christ in Louisville, Brother Wilson passed away in 2017. These thoughts here were written by him in 2008. I'll also be taking some text and stuff out of the article that Brother Ernest Lyon, the late Brother Ernest Lyon, who preached at the Highland Church many years ago, wrote back in the, uh, I think in the 90s or 80s. But Brother Wilson writes, in the beginning, part one, and I'm going to go back and forth between part one and two, so I hope I'll keep my train of thought going on. He says, I'm holding in my hand a faded and very frail looking magazine. It requires d delicate handling, and the front cover has become disconnected. But the contents are still legible. May I share with you some information about it? The front cover says, Volume 1, Number 1, March 1908, The Christian Word and Work. Motto, Work and Worship, Table of Contents, 734 Canal Street, New Orleans, Louisiana. The table of contents divided into seven main sections. Bible study department, contributed articles five, editorial, Louisiana department, personal letter from the founder, Dr. D.L. Watson, things current and miscellany. On a side note here, I have that copy, that original copy in my possession of the Christian Word and Work, Volume 1, Number 1. Brother Wilson continues, Inside we learn about more information on page 1. Under the name of the magazine we find is purposed, published monthly in the interest of primitive Christianity. Primitive in the sense of ancient or original. Of course, rather than its secondary sense of crude or uncivilized. It called on people to break free from the shackles of denominational creeds and study the Bible for themselves, but give that freedom to other believers. Its motto on the cover classic clarified its emphasis, worship the Lord and work for Him. A heading says, started in response to widespread needs. When Word and Work began, its special aim was to encourage individuals in the very small churches that were scattered throughout Louisiana and the Gulf region from Texas to the Atlantic. They had little chance for fellowship or in-depth teaching. David Lipscomb Watson, a pediatrician and founder, that's first issue lists him as the magazine's manager and Stanford Chambers and A.C. Harris as editors. All three were members of the Church of Christ at the corner of 7th and Camp Streets, New Orleans. Back to quote from Dr. Watson's intro article. Our new enterprise has sprung up from a desire to build the cause of our dear Redeemer. The fact that there are many, so many vast territories almost destitute of primitive Christianity and that one of the greatest of these fields is all about us, in which practically nothing is being done, weighs heavily upon us. We shall urge the churches to support the preaching of the gospel in the regions around them, and the people who know the will of the Lord be saved and add to the body of Christ's workers, and thus extend the good work on and on to every nook and corner of this land of ours, and the whole world, as he makes clear everywhere, has been evangelized. If you love Christ, you are anxious to have his gospel preached, 
to every creature to do your part in whatever manner you can. We want to keep in touch with one another. We want you to start to work for Christ today in your own home, neighborhood, or congregation. We want to make this magazine a means of inspiration for everyone who reads it, to strive harder to serve God better each succeeding day, to ask God to bless us, that we may always know the truth and have courage to do it, that we may never shun to declare the whole counsel of God, and that we may be the means of doing much good in the Master's vineyard. Thus ends this quote by Dr. D.L. Watson. Troubles and changes, he says here. Several years ago, I learned from my friend, historian Hans Rollman, some facts about the start of the word and work. September 1913, Stafford Chambers purchased the word and work from Dr. Watson. Since 1912, it has carried several articles by men like Charles Neal, who had premillennial beliefs, views opposed by Dr. Watson, who was a post-millennialist. Dr. Watson, I understand, sought vainly to get, regain control of it and had a few suits he filed against Brother Chambers and the warden work at that time and the say the courts, I understand, ruled with Brother Chambers. Dr. Watson was eventually disfellowshipped by the Southern Camp Church for various reasons, personal disagreements, and a dubious fundraising scheme for the church. You can read more about what happened there in Eric Deshaun's book called From Campbell to Katrina on the history of the church in New Orleans. Brother Chambers decided that Louisville would be a better, much better place and location for the magazine to be a good influence for spreading the gospel and strengthening the believers. We're now in an article written by Brother Ernest Lyon. For example, January 1916 issue, the one whose 75th anniversary we are celebrating right now, had articles by R.H. Bowl, E.L. Jorgensen, Stanford Chambers, still living in New Orleans at the time, H.L. Olmsted, Brother Barnabas, J.N. Gardner, W.J. Brown, David L. Cooper, and Don Carlos James. Included were Lord's Day Lessons, which R.H. Bow writing the lessons. This section was issued separately for our Sunday schools to use. Eventually, as you know, that section became a separate publication and is still being used in many churches today for their Sunday school work. In February 1916, Stafford Chambers, H.L. Olmsted, and E.L. Jorgensen were listed as co-editors with Brother Bow as editor-in-chief. The, that policy continued some time, but eventually it was dropped for the one name which the magazine was associated with many years, R.H. Bow, the Prince of Teachers for all who knew and heard him. As I mentioned earlier, though m most articles in the Word and Work were written by members of the Church of Christ, the idea was never imparted that only those belonging to such Congregations were saved, nor were articles by Christians from other backgrounds kept in their pages. For instance, during the first year of Brother Bowles' editorship, he reprinted in word and work articles by well-known Bible teachers, D.M. Panton, H.M. Pember, and perhaps others. He ran two articles from the Sunday School Times without giving authors names. He the uh, he, An article he himself wrote entitled About Books, he recommended books by J.M. Gray, R.A. Torrey, Charles Hodge, J.M. McGarvey, Hannah Whitehall Smith, and Philip Morrow. All of those who I mentioned, only McGarvey was from what we might call the Restoration Movement. Brother Bow was, however, careful to urge his readers to be discerning. He ended the just mentioned article by saying, Every book written by a man, no matter who the man is, comes under this rule, prove all things, hold fast that which is true. So if folks hear, watch this later, remember that paragraph. Appreciate it in your comments. Bobby Valentine's watching now. I hope that all our readers know that one policy has continued from the beginning. 
of the magazine. No editor or writer for the paper gets a penny for his labors, all doing it out of love and for Christ and his word. Brother Lyon writes further, I am not sure who printed the word work in New Orleans, but I do know of at least three who have done the work in Louisville. That's between 1916 on. The Pentecostal Publishing Company was done for several years. Then Don Carlos James established a print shop with Tona Covey as beloved and efficient typesetter and probably printer. And sometime later, the Hyde Printing Company became the printer and continues to this day publishing the paper with loving concern. To the Hyde family, we owe a great deal of thanks to their many contributions to the magazine throughout the years. And the Hyde Printing Company continued to print the magazine for the entirety now of that of its printed existence through 2008. Brother Robert Hyde was the editor at one time. Brother Lyon continues to write, Some of the tracks by Brother Ball that wrote were printed into book form and other ways. When the Warden work moved to Louisville, E.L. Jorgensen was the publisher for many good years. He was succeeded by J.R. Clark, who also joined with Brother Jorgensen as co-editor when the Lord called Brother Bow home in 1956. The publisher is not always listed, so I'll try not to continue that list. Stafford Chambers, who moved to Louisville in 1923, started another magazine called Truth in Advance in 1938 and combined with Word and Work in 1957. In September of 62, Gordon Linscott became the co-editor, publisher, or with E.L. Jorgensen as co-editors with J.R. Clark. But Linscott continued through the December issue of 1975. William Robert High became the mystery editor after Mr. Mester stopped. Later on, Brother Victor Broadus reinstated and started Missionary Messenger. Brother High became editor of the Word and Work in January 1976, and then in 1986, ten years later, Alec Wilson became co-editor with Brother Hyde, and then became sole editor in May of 87, Brother Hyde's homecoming. In his first editorial, Brother Wilson wrote these words about his predecessors. Warden Work has a rich heritage. Thanks to its founder and first editor, Stanford Chambers, on a side note here, the founder was Dr. D.L. Watson. Brother Chambers was there from the beginning almost. A stalwart dreader of the faith and proclaimer of the gospel. Then R.H. Bow, outstanding editor for 40 years, a master teacher of all the word of God, especially of God's grace. The co-editors E.L. Jorgensen and J.R. Clark, faithful, loving, humble men, concerned to build bridges and remove barriers among the people of God. Then Gordon Lynn Scott, with his deep passion for our Lord and Savior himself and our need to know him. Then William Robert Hyde, with his much-needed emphasis on life and teaching on Christian homes and solid relationships throughout the ages. We continue our story here and continue in the part now that Brother Wilson wrote again. One of the features of the magazine that I treasure very much is the obituaries of many so people I have come to know, including all the editors except the present one, who's continuing on high standard of the past. It is still a publication you can lend or give to anyone without apology for its contents and with the realization that you are doing a good thing for them in doing that. I've hinted above at some of the main emphasis of word and work throughout the more than four score years. Brother Wilson wrote an editorial about what facets of truth need to be given top priority in the magazine and gave 13 such priorities. One, the Lord Most High Himself and thus His grace and our worship of Him. Two, the cross, basis of our salvation. Three, holy character. Four, evangelism and world missions. Five, Christian education. Fruitful Bible teaching. Six, lessons from the past, lest we become unbalanced 
a fetish. Seven, hope for hope for the future, found in Christ's return and other prophetic teachings from the scripture. Eight, strength from the present, made possible by the in, organ, in, in, energizing indwelling Holy Spirit. Nine, strong Christian families. Ten, unity among God's people. Eleven, social issues, enlightenment, encouragement to be salt and light in our rotten society. Twelve, practical training for Christian workers and church leaders. Thirteen, revival, moving, God moving among us in an ungrieved, unquenched power. Decades earlier, E.L. Jorgensen had wrote, a loving welcome or warning in this matter. Among the many heresies, that is, the heresy of emphasis, wrong emphasis of this heresy, too many Christians of our kind have been guilty. If we aspire to be New Testament Christians, or people after the pattern of Paul and Peter, James and John, we must put the emphasis where they put it. Christ was the central. Jesus Christ himself, the glorious, glorious risen living being who is the center of all that concern him. He is our main concern. It is quite possible, in fact, easy to become taken up with movements and subjects, good as they may be, more than, more than with him, our only Lord and Savior. We jump over to another article that Brother Alec Wilson wrote in 2008, near the end of the Warden Works printed existence. And on a side note here, I think when the Warden Works quit publication in 2008, there were only a few periodicals associated with Restoration Movement churches still going. The oldest being the Gospel Advocate, and at that time the firm foundation was still being operated, and printed is not being printed now and not online at all. And I think our black brethren had a paper out called Christian Echo, I understand. So that would be probably the oldest of the non instrumental periodicals among churches of Christ. The Christian Standard with the independent Christian churches is still being published also today. But back to Brother Wilson's article. He goes back into the history of the word and work and gives some more tidbits of what happened in the Word and Works 101 year printed history. He said, I knew Brother Chambers personally and heard him preach and teach and read many of his articles in Word and Work and elsewhere. Admittedly, that was 40 years after the events that happened in New Orleans. As becoming sole editor, Chambers added several main departments Department of First Principles, of Work and Worship, of Soul Winning, of Prophecy, a Bible school, etc. He was assisted by Charles Neal, E.L. Jorgensen, H.L. Olmsted. All of them emphasized the grace of God versus, versus legalism. All four held pre mill views, but also believed in the freedom of simple Christians to quote a title of a pamphlet that Brother Bow wrote, that is the liberty to study God's word and come to one's own convictions without having to conform to any brotherhood, creed, or papacy. He has a title called Editor for Four Decades, Facing Much Opposition. By January 1916, Chambers felt Warden Work would do better if more centrally located and edited by R.H. Bow. On another place that I read, in the Warden work as it was written in New Orleans, Brother Chambers mentioned that he had held a meeting at the Portland Avenue Congregation in the winter of 1915. And it was decided at that meeting there to transfer the Warden work over to Brother Bow and to bring the Warden work to Louisville. That was after Brother Bow had been dropped as front page editor of the Gospel Advocate. We have here Brother Bo continuing as editor for 40 years until his death in 1956. He continued to preach at the Portland Avenue Church all that time. He started there in 1904, and except for about an 11-month period 
in 1909-1910-11, where he taught the Bible in Brother Stribling School in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. He taught and preached at Portland Avenue Church of Christ in Louisville. The Carriers are still going there. Not as many people as in the past. Brother Gary Butts is the preacher there at the congregation now. Another side note, the Port Avenue Church, since 1895, has only had about six preachers there. Had George Clingman till 1902. R.H. Ball was preached there after that. C.V. Wilson followed Brother Ball. Well, and then with Brother Wilson was Brother Robert Hyde, and then Brother Alec Wilson, who was the editor of the Warden Work also, and now Brother Gary Butts. But back to our story here, our text that Brother Alec Wilson wrote in 2008. During the decades that various Church of Christ papers waged bitter war on each other over several diverse issues, the 30s through the 70s especially, most of them were in harmony and opposing word and work. Bowl usually ignored such vicious negativism and sought to be as positive as possible. A librarian at Harding in the 40s told students there, if you're tired of all the feuding and fighting in various papers and want something constructive and wholesome, read the word and work, end quote. J.N. Armstrong, then president of Harding College, kept on befriending Brother Ball, and endured some strong criticism for it. Popular preacher G.C. Brewer refused to join in the attacks, maintaining a positive relationship. He probably endured some barbs too. Brother Brewer was not of the premillennial viewpoint, but he did not think that those who opposed it, such as Foy Wallace Jr. and others in that time there, were writing their vicious attacks where they wanted to condemn people who just associated with people they disagreed with. Back to Brother Wilson's article. A longtime teacher at a Christian Christ College deeply appreciated RHB and Chambers and become a Warden Works subscriber for 55 years ago. His description has never lapsed since then. Through the d- decades he wrote and submitted several articles which were published, but for decades he used a pseudonym because of hostility he would have faced. In these latter better days, when legalism and sectarianism have declined in numerous places, such a step would not be necessary, thank God. Bowles' deep-seated desire in teaching biblical prophecy was always to promote practical trust and obedience. He wrote, Doing one's duty is first necessity to be sure, but who can work and keep on working without constant motive and inspiration, without assurance that it will count in God's plans, that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. He felt prophecy's main role, excuse me, I got a sneeze, I'm very sorry about about that, folks. Very sorry about that. He talks on about here in Brother Wilson's thing here. He felt prof- he felt prophecy, that's Brother Ball. Main role was to main role was to motivate people. Motivate People for greater service to our Lord. He felt that prophecy should be that. He said, unless what we learn of prophecy of the Lord's coming of age to come, as well as other truths, makes us more humble, more obedient, more loving and Christ-like, we have indeed learned in vain. This is always his approach from his early years onward. I think he gave that same quote in Brother Hardy's paper, The Way, back in 19... 19- Oh, three or so. But Brother Bo also wrote, 
please do not get the idea that, or Alec Wilson wrote, that the word and work was or is a one theme journal. Or Hans Roman commented, Bo was no single issue writer, but also a gifted author on apologetic, exegetical, and spiritual topics. Word and work also promoted foreign missions through a news department conducted by Don Carlos James, and for over 50 years published the Lord's Day Lessons, a serialized commentary. Bo and the five editors who followed him probably laid as much stress on the stunning grace of God as prophecy. One of Word and Work's several models was to declare the whole counsel of God. That meant, emphasizing, as just mentioned, the grace of God to counter legalism and sectarianism, which is spread in so many churches of Christ. It meant centering on Christ's cross and our cross as well. It meant giving positive, practical teaching about the Holy Spirit, not merely denouncing the errors of the Pentecostals. In another article that Alec Wilson wrote, he refers back to the magazine's early history. So in this lesson today, we're going back, back in the, back in the past, going forward, and going back again. Alec writes again. This is part two of his article, 100 Years Old, To God Be the Glory. It's written, I think, in the second to last issue that Warden Work had in print. He says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. Psalm 115, verse 1 from the New International Version. He says it was 1908. Teddy Roosevelt was president. Model T. Ford began to roll off the assembly line. And Thomas Edison began a legal dispute over the rights to the moving picture projector. The Detroit Tigers won the American League pennant, sparked by a young outfielder named Ty Cobb. And down in New Orleans, a few disciples of the Lord Jesus began posting a Christian magazine named The Christian Word and Work. For several months, a special offer was made. Three months for only 10 cents. 1914, it dropped to 5 cents per copy, only 50 cents a year. Some interesting items are found in that first few issues. I have seen from the 1908-15 era, there was a monthly column called Our Boys and Girls, edited by a lady called Cousin Ellen. Article 1913 caught my attention. It is entitled, Immorality Laid to Women's Garb. Describes how a state legislator from Cincinnati, alarmed by a great wave of immorality now spreading over the country, introduced a bill asking that the governor appoint a commission to prescribe the fashion to be worn by the women of the state of Ohio. We wonder how that was taken or resulted. But it was the advertisements which perhaps strike you most. You could buy a teacher's reference Bible with concordance, a Bible dictionary, other helps for $1.75. And those early issues contained ads only for religious supplies and books, also for a coal dealer, a pharmacy, an insurance agency, a clothing store, typewriters, self-sharpening secret spring shears, always sharp. The bottom of the table of contents page, another ad, hosiery, darn proof, guaranteed, 12 pairs, $1, intense black, tenor or assorted, gents or ladies, from a hosiery mill in North Carolina. An editorial says some readers dislike having ads in the magazine, which replies given they might, they might be ones who would perhaps donate some more to the cause and pay their subscriptions on time. Moving north, the next heading. Later came 1916. President Wilson and the whole country were fearful about war in Europe. Wilson also advocated women's suffrage, but even that year before women got to vote, Jeanette Rankin was elected as the first woman in the United States Congress. That was also the year that Einstein developed the theory of relativity. Rockefeller's personal wealth passed $1 billion. A young printer named Norman Rockwell for the first time was drawing a pier on a magazine cover, and in New Orleans, editor Stanford Chambers proposed that Warden Work magazine be edited by R.H. Ball and published in Louisville. 
the offer was accepted and a new era began. In this issue, we continue to look back to our magazine's roots and beginnings with gratitude to the Lord. Tis grace has brought us safe thus far, and grace shall lead us home. Brother Bo used to say of the word and work that was always dying, yet behold, it lives. In January, February of 2008, we told about D.L. Watson, the originator of the magazine, and about Stanford Chambers and R.H. Bowl. That took us back from 1908 1956. See, Joshua DeMint is joined. I'm probably near the end of this lesson on the history of the Word and Work magazine. Hope you'll go back and watch the whole thing. And if you do watch it, make sure you make comments, look to the preface of this history page on Facebook. I really appreciate it. After Brother Bowl died in 1956, E.O. Jorgensen and J.R. Clark became co-editors. Brother Jorgensen had been a frequent writer since before Brother Bowl became the editor in 1916 and his close friend throughout the eight decades. If you look in the archives around 1911, 12, 13, or 14 or so, Brother Jorgensen wrote many articles in that paper. We had a we had two videos about two weeks ago on our historical page here on Facebook about the life of Brother E.L. Jorgensen, and I just finished one last night on the life of Stanford Chambers. Back to Brother Jorgensen here. A wonderful musician and song leader, he compiled the outstanding hymnal Great Songs to Church for decades used by many churches of Christ. For a few years, he left his name out of the book because congregations who were opposed what they called the premillennial movement, would not buy it if his name was there. He also finalized the vast material which Don Carlos James had compiled from the writings of Bible scholars and preachers throughout the centuries. It is published in a book as Faith of Our Fathers and presented strong evidence that the basic premillennial view had been held by a number of godly, orthodox Christians throughout the church history. That book was long out of print, but is available now online that in the Word and Work, it was posted on the Word and Work in serial form in the late 40s through the early 50s, then put in a book form, which was out, out of print. I had that book reprinted a few years ago, and if you'll email me at LarryMiles1952 at gmail.com, I'll tell you about it. Also, we had a book that Brother Bowl put out, well, really about his writings. It's put out by F.L. Rao of Cincinnati in 1917 of a book that brother, because it's editorials that Brother Bo wrote as the front page editor of the Gospel Advocate, 1909-1910 specifically. It's called Truth and Grace. You know, email me at LarryMiles1952 at gmail.com. I'll tell you how to get a hold of that book also. But back to the article here. J.R. Clark wrote a series of articles on various topics many of them studies of scriptural passages. He and ELJ continued the desire of the magazine and from his first to build bridges and remove barriers among disciples of the Lord. Like all of the Word Work editors, except the founder, D.L. Watson, who was a pediatrician, Brother Clark was a preacher also. He ministered for many years at Duggar, Indiana, and then at, even longer at Armsby Avenue Church in Louisville. He was a gracious, pleasant, and humble man. Recently, Dale Jorgensen, nephew of E.L. Jorgensen, wrote a personal letter to the editor of Word and Work, musing on his aspects of the Word and Work throughout the ages, decades, excuse me. He included these comments, especially about J.R. Clark. Thanks to the spade work of Ernie Stefanek and Hans Roman, with support of Alice Mullins, there's now a complete index of 50 years of Word and Work online. The 410 names of contributors in that index read like an expanded version of Hebrews chapter 11. Many Bible scholars, saints, missionaries who have gone on to immortal life. Several names still move me to see them in print, such as J.R. Clark, who served as publisher for the journal many years and was patiently content to serve in a, quote, John the Baptist, end quote, role as a chief supporter of others, who did most of the editorial work. I did an article, or video, two videos of the life that Brother Jorgensen 
Dale Jorgensen again wrote about E.L. Jorgensen. Also, maybe a side note here is a place for this, a good time for this. The word in work, we have, I have had 75 issues from 1908 to 1915 and the complete catalog of 1916 to 2008 had them all scanned in the PDF forms, which are searchable, and Brother Scott Harp is hosting them on his site, restorationmovement.com. You'll see them under magazines that have word and work, and you can go to that. You can search the database from over 1,250 issues of word and work. If you'd like to have a DVD, it's, it's DVD because it's 4.5 gigabyte of space that has the complete word and work from 19... to 2008. And the set of issues before 1915 available. I Send me an email, LarryMiles1952 at gmail.com and I'll give you the, the cost on that there also. Back to the article there. And sorry for the phone that rang in the background there. 1962, Gordon Linscott became editor Continues editor through 1976. A quiet and humble man, but the waters ran deep. After he fell asleep in Jesus, someone commented, Gordon influenced many people for the Lord quietly. And though his life had his full share of trials and sorrows, a younger disciple and close friend of his recently told me, Gordon was the most joyful man I've ever known. Instead from his deep passion for our Savior, he stressed that we need to know him personally, not just verses, Truths, service, and church, as important they are in his, their place. Alec writes, I was privileged to know him well after he came to Louisville to become a teacher at Portland Christian School and to preach at Fisherville Church. Shortly after that, he became editor as well. I remember conversations and often times of worship and prayer with him. He joined a small group of men who met to pray for deeper walk with Christ and for revival in the churches. As editor of his articles were mostly not long, some, like some articles who shall remain unnamed, but contained deep insights and pack wallop spiritually. A major regret of mine when Ruth and I were overseas was that my face-to-face -face fellowship with Gordon was limited to furloughs every four or five years. Years later, Parkinson's disease ravaged his body and mind. His dear wife missed him throughout those difficult years. His faith never wavered. But it was so sad to see the real Gordon going and gone. What happy and unimaginable reunions there will be in the coming of Christ. Come Lord Jesus. Gordon naturally continued word and works emphasis on grace due to his own experiences here. He grew up in congregations and at college steeped in legalism. In college he re reasoned with himself like this. If I become a preacher, I'll have more chance of getting to heaven than if I didn't. But if I become a foreign missionary, I have an even better chance. So he became a missionary to Italy, and there realized he still wasn't saved, at least not from hopeless self-dependence. A Church of Christ missionary that helped him to see that and lead him to trust in the Savior's righteousness, not his own. He came to become a changed man who never got over his passion for Jesus. 1976, we back up a second here. The first article that I ever had printed in Word and Work was in 1975 under Brother Lynn Scott's editorship. 1976, when Brother Gordon became disabled, Brother Robert Hyde took over the helm and continued to 1986. He, too, was a prince of a man. For three generations, members of the Hyde family had been mainstays at the Portland Avenue Church in Louisville. Robert grew up there and attended Portland Christian School and for a long time, he and his dear Jane were the school's volunteer treasurers. Robert Hyde baptized me at Portland Avenue in September of 1972, and I've been thankful to the Hyde family for their encouragement throughout the years. Robert loved the Bible, preached his gospel over 30 years at Nelsonville Church down in Nelson County. Then he returned to Portland for 16 years, first as co-preacher with C.V. Wilson, Alex's father, 
and then soul preacher. At that time, he also led or co-led the Hyde Printing Company with his brother, Walter Hyde, who was an elder also at Portland Avenue, and other businesses that the Hyde Printing Company had to go in. His loving nature, na nature, calm faith, and steady sacrificial services stood out. So did his emphasis on life and writing on church-centered family living. He became deeply concerned for world missions. Was a long-time editor of the Missionary Messenger before becoming editor of Word and Work. An interesting insight into Robert's nature is seeing the decision he made in his latter years. Though still busy running his print shop in Portland area, he bought and moved to a farm in Indiana. Why? One reason was he wanted to raise sheep. Why? Because the Bible's soul portrays God as a shepherd and us as his sheep. Robert felt that if he personally experienced shepherding, he would grow in understanding God's relationship toward us and vice versa. I'm sure he did. The Word Work was a print magazine, we said, from 1908 to 2008, 101 years. 1908 to 1915 in the city of New Orleans, Louisiana. 1916 to 2008 in Louisville, Kentucky. In retrospect, Word Work editors were Dr. D.L. Watson at Stanford Chambers in New Orleans, R.H. Bowl, J.R. Clark, E.L. Jorgensen, Gordon Lynn Scott, and Robert Hyde, and Alex Wilson in Louisville in the print version of Word and Work. Word and Work's now being published online since 2009. You can go to wordandwork.org. Myself and Sandra Nago are the co-editors. We're still trying to present the truth, to uphold the Word of God, to put the emphasis on the grace of God, the indwelt Holy Spirit, the soon coming of Jesus, or the imminent coming of Jesus, which means he could come at any time. Wardenwork.org. You can go there and find the current issue. You can go there and find, as a link where it says, past issues, which are the issues that have been done online since 2009. And then there's a link on there for archived issues. And that'll take you to Brother Scott Harp, the preacher at the Crittenden Drive Church of Christ in Russell, Kentucky, to his website, where he's graciously offered and is hosting the all the archive word works that I had scanned throughout the years from 1908 to 1915, about 75 issues, 1916 to 2008, complete set. I want to thank Scott Harp, men like Tom Chillers down at Freed Hardeman, Wayne Kilpatrick at Heritage, Brother Benny Johns down in Alabama, who scanned many, a vast majority of the bound volumes that I sent him to do. And may we look to our historical heritage, knowing that we can learn from our heritage as long as we don't take the words of these men and women who put out word and work as scripture. They're not inspired. The word of God's inspired. Men like Campbell and Stone and Scott, Lipscomb, McGarvey, men like that wrote many great things about God's word, but they're human beings like us. I want to close, close with a quote that came into the May of 1956 issue of Word and Work. Brother Bo had died the previous month in April. The whole month of May's issue in Word and Work was of a tribute to Brother Robert Henry Bowe, 1875 to 1956. One man who wrote a tribute was living in Louisiana at the time. He's now in a nursing home in Texas. He's still living probably at least 90 years old. Brother Ken East. He wrote that Brother Bo had told him that no truth of Scripture is truly yours until you find it for yourself in God's word, end quote. Brother Bo further wrote to somebody that with his long experience of studying the Bible, he ought to be able to tell you what 
the Bible said. But you must believe because you yourself have a personal faith in God's word. I think people in the pews or our classes or our people have a right, and maybe the right, not right word, but a right to, under, to believe and expect that the people teaching the word of God, whether preachers, elders, missionaries, circle teachers, men or women, are teaching God's word. But we have a responsibility also ourselves to go to God's word and look for ourselves. The Bereans in chapter 11, verse 17 of the book of Acts were commended by Dr. Luke because, or by God really, because they searched the scriptures daily to see whether the words of God were true. And I always say that if an inspired apostle did not mind being checked up on, we should neither. Thanks a lot for watching this Facebook video on the history of the word and work. I realize that's been a long video. I probably should have broken into two lessons. Now thank Bobby Valentine from California and Joshua DeMent for watching this thing. I'm going to download this to my hard drive and later today or tomorrow I'll upload that to YouTube and put a link on this page, House Our Heritage, so that when people link on it, they can share it with others who don't have Facebook could watch this here. And again, I ask you to go back to our preface on this page, How's Our Heritage, to read how we ought to act when we're talking about history and stuff. The same preface is on the page that Brother Tom Childers, Brother Terry Gardner, and Brother Wayne Kilpatrick, and Scott Harp have called French the Restoration. Let's keep looking for Christ's return, not knowing when he's coming back. Nobody in the history of the word and work, for what I can understand, believed that you had to believe what we believed and taught. We always ask you to go to the word of God. The main thing we, I think we can all hold in common is that Christ is coming back for us. And we're to be not only looking for his coming, watching for his coming, waiting for his coming, but longing for his coming. But most of all, maybe we are working for him who died for us. We can't work our way to heaven, but we are to be the best workers the Lord has in his kingdom. So thanks a lot, folks. And I look forward to maybe some comments on this later. Thanks a lot.